hello. Thank you for that introduction. After college, I had the unique opportunity to volunteer in a pain treatment clinic. Here I saw many patients with a wide spectrum of chronic pain conditions. My experience with one patient in particular had a profound effect on my career. Chris was a 10-year-old that was diagnosed with complex regional pain syndrome, or CRPS, a horrible pain condition that's associated with producing excruciating amounts of pain with just the lightest touch. Chris had CRPS all over his chest after a really bad car accident. Just imagine a super bad sunburn when you put a t-shirt on, that sensitive, throbbing, burning pain. This is how Chris felt all the time. His favorite thing to do was swim, and he couldn't even do that because just a splash of water can put him in pain for the rest of the day. Even baths, showers, you can imagine. He and his family were desperate for pain relief. They tried everything from a multitude of drug therapies to hypnosis. And the day that I met him, he was trying acupuncture to no avail. So I worked with Chris. I taught him an ancient technique called mindfulness meditation. And much to my surprise, he said he felt immediate pain relief. He was like, yeah, I mean, I feel it, but it just doesn't bother me anymore. OK. So this really surprised me. Um, and it motivated me to go to graduate school to understand how mind-body approaches affect pain. Chronic pain is complicated. It's constructed and modulated by a constellation of interactions between sensory, cognitive, and emotional factors, rendering the treatment of pain difficult and often a financial burden. In fact, our own Institute of Medicine has characterized chronic pain as a silent epidemic because it affects over 100 million Americans and 1.5 billion people worldwide. Pain's also expensive. It costs the United States alone $635 billion a year in lost work productivity as well as medical treatments. Chronic pain affects more people than stroke, diabetes, heart disease, and cancer combined. So these st statistics highlight the importance of developing, testing, and verifying cost-effective, fast-acting, and non-pharmacological approaches to treating pain, such as mindfulness meditation. Yet, what is mindfulness? Put simply, it's non-judgmental awareness of the present moment. We can cultivate this skill through the practice of meditation. In fact, for thousands of years, contemplatives and Buddhist monks alike have postulated that the state of meditation can uniquely diminish the subjective experience of pain. For instance, in the ancient Buddhist text called the Salata Sutta, it states that when the uninstructed, run-of-the-mill person is touched by a painful slash bodily feeling, he worries and grieves, laments, weeps, and is distraught. It's as if the man is pierced by two darts, a physical and mental dart. But he goes on to say, in the case of a well-taught disciple, i.e. a meditator, when he is touched by a painful feeling, he will not be distraught. It's one kind of feeling he experiences, a bodily one, but not a mental feeling. It's as if the man were pierced by the first, but not second dart. They had a way with words back then. This is great and all, but only until recently have we developed a technology such as brain imaging to examine and potentially verify what these Buddhist monks have been saying. For instance, Joshua Grant and Pierre Rainville published a study a few years back where they found that lifelong Zen meditation practitioners required a significantly higher level of painful stimulation to feel the same amount of pain as aged matched non-meditators. Their brain imaging analyses were super interesting as well. They found that brain activation corresponding to feeling or sensing the experience of pain were highly active, delineated in red. Brain regions associated with evaluating and or putting meaning to the feeling of pain were deactivated, as shown in blue. 
These findings were remarkably consistent with the principles of mindfulness. It is as if these meditators and monks were able to take on the first dart, but to let go of the second. However, we live in a Western society, and I like to call it a drive-through society, where we have a tendency to be attracted to quick and easy things, such as the fact that you can pull up to a building, up to a window, and someone can transport food from the window into our car, at which point we drive away. <laughs> we want our dry cleaning in less than an hour. And it seems like every other TV commercial is asking me to ask my doctor if drug X is right for me. <laughs> the same is true for health improvement regimens. We tend to be attracted to exercises and diets that promise results quickly. For instance, there's a military diet that promises that you will lose 10 pounds in just three days. And who can forget buns of steel and eight-minute abs? We believe that meditation, too, may be more clinically attractive if we could demonstrate the benefits of meditation after a brief training. For instance, one of my colleagues who's running a big meditation study examining the effects of an eight-week intervention on asthma cited that 50% of eligible asthma patients did not want to participate, citing the length of the intervention as the reason. So, for the last 15 years, I have developed and examined the effects of a very brief mindfulness meditation intervention across four days, 20 minutes a day. Our participants are taught to sit with a straight posture, and you could try this if you'd like. Close your eyes. Take a deep breath. Relax. Focus on the changing sensations of the breath as it arises in your consciousness. Mentally note the cool, tingling air as it enters your nose, the rise and fall of your chest and abdomen as you inhale, exhale. Following the breath with your mind's eye as the breath leaves the nose, mentally noting the warm, flowing air. And not if, but when your mind becomes distracted, whether it's a fleeting thought, emotion, sensation. We teach our practitioners to acknowledge that sensory event and to simply let it go without judging themselves or that distractor. And the way we let it go in mindfulness meditation is just to gently bring the attention back to the breath and repeat. We have found that this intervention can significantly reduce depression, anxiety, improve cardiovascular health, as well as pain. However, we feel like we really need to market this technique in the same line of advertising as eight-minute abs. So maybe you guys can work with me here. How about 80-minute enlightenment? Do you not have time to join your local monastery in the northern Himalayas? Do you need a quick and easy way to realize that all sentient beings are made up of one collective consciousness? <laughs> How about 80-minute enlightenment? <laughs> we, we got some work to do, and I, I'm just kidding. But, but <laughs> mindfulness is super popular nowadays. We've seen an exponential growth in the scientific publications focused on delineating the effects of mindfulness meditation. Furthermore, mindfulness is seemingly in our mainstream media. We have pretty blonde women meditating on the cover of Time magazine. It's on the cover of popular publications such as Scientific American and the zenith of all popular culture, Anderson Cooper. <laughs> Yet, we still don't understand how it works. For instance, when I was traveling in Southeast Asia, I took this picture in northern Thailand, in Chiang Mai. And what you're seeing here are young Buddhist monks blessing this woman. And she had just offered them food, water, and flowers. And this is a very common and beautiful scene in Southeast Asia. But it struck me. Can we really generalize the effects of Buddhist monks and long-term practitioners to everyday folks? that work 40 hours a week, have to pay the bills, and have the daily stressors that we do in a Western society. You see, these monks, 
live in a monastery so they don't have to worry about paying the bills or finding shelter. Further, they walk around like religious deities. They don't have to worry about food and water because they're offered these things through the local community. So there might be some placebo-related responses that arise from a lifetime dedicated to meditation practice. And even if you weren't a monk, even if you haven't dedicated your life to meditation, just simply meditating can produce placebo effects just because of meditation's health-promoting reputation. In our society, for a clinical drug or intervention to be found clinically valid, it has to be found to be more effective than placebo across multiple phases of clinical trials. Yet we've been slow to hold meditation to this level of scrutiny. And even if we did, what would a meditation placebo controlled trial look like? So in our laboratory, we have spent some time trying to develop and understand this dilemma. And we have recently developed a sham placebo mindfulness meditation intervention. The point here is to lead people to believe that they're practicing mindfulness meditation when in fact they're not. Our study participants are told that they've been randomly assigned to a mindfulness meditation intervention. Across four days, 20 minutes a day, they sit with a straight posture, closing their eyes, taking deep breaths every two to three minutes as we sit here in mindfulness meditation. We matched all aspects of the genuine meditation intervention to the sham meditation intervention except the explicit instructions to practice mindfulness, i.e. non-judgmental awareness to the breath. We even matched the time spent giving instructions between the two interventions. So in our latest study, we compared the effects of genuine meditation to sham meditation in response to noxious painful heat while we scanned people's brains. And here's what we found. Mindfulness meditation was significantly more effective than placebo meditation at reducing pain. Mindfulness reduced pain by 44%, and much to our surprise, sham meditation reduced pain by a whopping 24%. Let me put this into perspective. Using the same pain scales and the, therm and the same thermal stimulation paradigm that we used, our colleagues found that one clinical dose of morphine reduces pain by 20%. So these effects are not trivial. Our brain imaging results were really interesting as well. We found that activation in a brain region called the orbitofrontal cortex, right behind the eyeballs, was associated with meditation-induced pain relief. This is a brain region that's critically involved in changing the context and or meaning of pain. For instance, the meaning of pain, like during mile 23, 24 in a marathon, in the legs is different than the meaning of the same kind of pain in the legs if you're suffering from fibromyalgia. In the former case, it's part of a great accomplishment. It's part of the process. Some might, might argue that it's even rewarding. I wouldn't, but some would. <laughs> but in the case of fibromyalgia, this is a consequence of a horrible disease. It can cause depression and anxiety. So these findings are pretty consistent with what our subjects told us. They said that they were able to experience the pain, but simply let it go by realizing that it's only momentary and fleeting. And they didn't have to react to something that was essentially already over. We also found that greater activation of a brain region called the anterior cingulate cortex predicted meditation-induced analgesia. This is a brain region that has been repeatedly found to control pain through attention as well as the ability to regulate emotional responses to pain. We also found that deactivation of a brain region called the thalamus that's rooted deep inside the brain predicted meditation-induced analgesia. The thalamus is critical at facilitating the transmission of pain from the body to the brain. In fact, no information from the body except the sense of smell 
can enter the brain without first going through the thalamus. It's as if the thalamus is a gateway to pain, and mindfulness seems to close the gate from allowing the elaboration of pain to go throughout the cortex. And we have some evidence of this. You see, there is a direct anatomical highway from the thalamus to a brain region called the primary somatosensory cortex that's associated with processing not only the intensity of pain, but also the location of it. When our subjects were simply at rest with their eyes closed during painful stimulation, we found that this activity was very high. However, when our subjects meditated during painful stimulation, we can no longer detect it. So it seems as if meditation after a brief intervention reduces both darts of pain, the first and second. And we're currently conducting research to examine the transition from early stages of meditation practice to expert level meditation. What about our sham meditators? We didn't find any brain activation that was related to their pain relief. We did find, though, that those who lowered their respiration rate the most reported the highest pain relief. So there seems to be some kind of bottom-up relaxation response with sham and more of a top-down control of pain with mindfulness. So our results suggest, A, mindfulness doesn't reduce pain through one avenue, but through multiple pathways. That meditation's pain-relieving effects do go above and beyond the effects of a placebo response. And our brain imaging analyses show that there's distinct processes here. So they are different. So these findings should foster the clinical validity of this technique. So if you're suffering physical or emotional pain, it wouldn't hurt you, no pun intended, for you to try mindfulness meditation. You don't have to be a monk. However, these results should be interpreted with caution. This isn't a cure-all to meditation by any means. In fact, we do know that the longer you train in meditation, the more stabilized the effects will be. It's just like going to the gym and working out a bicep. It's no difference between mental and physical training. And what about Chris, a 10-year-old with CRPS? Well, I recently spoke with him, and he's doing well, but he's still suffering from CRPS and is still in pain. However, he's continued his mindful practice and told me that he's accepted the fact that he's going to be in pain for the rest of his life. But he's been able to simply let go of the interpretations of that painful experience. It seems as if Chris has accepted the first dart of pain and simply let go of the second. Thank you. Thank you.